Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the fifth in our week of revision sessions. Uh, quite a few of you I know are joining for the fifth day in a row, which is super impressive. And uh, the Tutor Two Student Collective is so on it for our exams. I think we'll we'll make it together as we get towards the 18th of May. Now, next week uh, we have four economic sessions. I'm away Easter Monday watching some football, uh, but I'll be starting again next Tuesday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday next week we'll do four sessions covering labor markets uh, market structures economic efficiency development and the uk economy so hopefully four useful sessions for you uh jim my stunt double is running five business sessions next week starting monday 11 o'clock slightly earlier time and so if you want to double up on business and economics everything kicks off at 11 o'clock normally uh going forward so uh, looking forward to today. If you want to uh, contribute to the chat window, it's always amazing to see people's contributions. We'll give lots of shout outs on the screen, but you just need to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. And the week after next, we are in Portsmouth, Bristol and Birmingham for our live grade booster sessions. I know quite a few came to White City and Stratford uh, uh, last week. And then the week after that, last week of April, gosh, into the first week of May, we we're at London for the final Edexcel AQA grade booster sessions. They're always exciting. Looking forward to joining some of you there. OK, let's make a start. We're looking today at trade, some challenging questions. Uh, here we go. Have we got these multiple choice? I think I've got six multiple choice questions for you. Here's our first question. Which form of economic integration describes a situation in which there is free trade between member, member nations, but who set a common external tariff? But they each have a different currency. So if you're ready, post the answer in the chat window. Different levels of integration between nations, Tom and Louis, Charlie, 
Dylan and uh, Jake have all got the right answer. Uh, Francis as well has got the right answer, and so too is Kieran. Let's check the answer. Nice easy start. It is indeed a customs union. Now, customs union is a hot topic in trade economics. Not just because, of course, the UK has left the European Union, but there are different customs unions around the world, as shown on the screen, if you want to take a screenshot. And Edexcel, for example, have chosen uh, quite a few different examples of customs unions in the past. The one I'm interested in at the moment is the East African community. They're trying to build a single market there. Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda and Burundi. Interesting, interesting uh, customs union. They're trying to develop a single market. Question number two. According to economic theory, an increase in global trade liberalization should lead to which one of the following effects? What do we think for question number two? And straight away the answers are coming through. We like to, uh, we'll post some answers on the chat window when we get into the short answer questions. So just, this is a little introduction for those of you who are new to our revision sessions. It looks like everybody is choosing the answers C, including Tom and Joe, uh, Robert and Connor, here we go, let's check the answer. Uh, yeah, well done, a rising global output in theory. And of course, this is one of our favorite phrases in economics that choose to do in theory, it should lead to a rising global output. Of course, in practice, it might not. Francis Johnson sends a message to the Tutor 2 Collective, never stop revising. This is your future. Those are inspiring words, Francis. I think everybody has just got a massive lift from what you've just posted in the chat window. Here's question three. And now this is an interesting question. This is a great question from 2022, in fact. The diagram shows the change in the supply curve of imports, S to S1 to S to S2, after the introduction by the government of a trade protection measure. But which one? The slightly quirky diagram here, supply curve of imports, price against quantity. What do we think on this one? George says that Francis's quote was the thin line between inspiring and panic inducing. I think that's a good point. Nearly 200 people in the chat window uh, in, the, in the live session today, which is fantastic. A lot of people saying D here. Louis goes D, 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 D. I think he's obviously got a uh, stuck keyboard. Uh, here we go. Let's look at the answer. The answer is in D, D. Yes, you can supply any amount up to the quota, in which case the supply curve becomes vertical. Somebody's asked what's an embargo. An embargo is a is a ban on imports. The supply curve becomes the vertical axis. Well then, now these questions get a little harder. Uh, do we need to draw this? I've never seen it before. Well, was that a don't worry? Uh, you won't have to draw it. Uh, if you've got a if you've got a normal quota diagram, it'd be absolutely fine. Question four coming up. Now this is interesting. A country X joins a customs union with country Y and will remove the tariff on its imports of good M from country Y. Under which conditions will trade creation in country X be the largest? So country X is joining a customer union with Y and therefore the, the tariff from Y on imports of good M uh, are eliminated. So you join a button in which conditions will trade creation be the greatest? What do we think on this one? A lot of people saying B, I would say the majority of people saying B, uh, including Chloe and Merlin, Danny and Yuri. Let's check the answer. It is B. So clearly the trade creation effect will be the bigger if that tariff is significant and also if there's a relatively high price in our system demand. So you're going to get a big, a big shift of consumer preferences, expenditure switching towards that good. Question five, I, I must say these questions get progressively harder. Question six is nuts. Here's question five. What might increase the benefits of a country gains from trade? Which of those four options here? Five is maybe slightly easier. What might increase the benefits a country gains from international trade? Okay, what do we think here? Answers coming through. And the uh, consensus of the Tutor 2 student collection, including Noah and Toby, the Riddler is back in the building, uh, Jasmine's here, and the collective answer is A, let's check. It is a falling world price, of course, reduces the costs of logistics and things, and therefore in theory should 
amplify the gains from specialization and trade. Now, question six is hard. Let's have a look at question six. Question six is hard. The world trade price of cars in the country is $10,000. At this price, domestic car producers supply 100,000 cars, but domestic consumers purchase 200,000 cars. The government imposes a tariff of 10%. Can you visualize the diagram there? The tariff is imposed of 10%. So it's going to take the price up to $11,000. Under which conditions will this tariff raise the most revenue for the government? You can almost visualize the diagram here. So you're looking for that tariff revenue box. You put a tariff on the product. It's going to raise the price from 10,000 to 11,000. At the moment, imports were 100,000. Which combination will raise the most revenue for the government and we're getting answers coming through a lot of people here are saying b or c uh, a lot of people saying c what do we think well of course the key here is that the government gets revenue from the tariff so it probably won't be c to give you a little clue because the government doesn't want the level of imports to go down particularly a slightly quirky question. Have I got the answer right here? <laughs> so a lot of people now saying A. Uh, let's let's look at the answer. Uh, Bonnie got A. Tom, Louis got A. So did Manav. It is A. Ta the tariff revenue will be higher if domestic producers are fairly slow to respond to the tariff. So you're looking for low elasticity. Um, uh, <laughs> nice, nice quote from George there. Uh, so looking for low price elasticity and also a low price elasticity of demand. People still buy the cars, even if the price goes up. That will boost the tariff revenue. Of course, what you really want is if you want the if you want the tariff to increase production in domestic markets, you want a high elasticity to supply. But in fact, you, the question is about the tariff revenue. That was a slightly harder question. Congratulations to those of you who got it right, by the way. OK, let's crack on. Let's quickly look at, at the diagram. Now, what I've got here for you is a, is a classic trade liberalization diagram. Um, uh, oftentimes, exams ask questions about tariffs, and students are, are really good on the tariff diagram. But if they ask a question on trade liberalization, a lot of students draw the tariff diagram. You just have to reverse engineer it a little bit. So here's our diagram. It shows the market for beef, and uh, the price P2 is the world supply of beef with an import tariff. So that's with a tariff. Now, the next slide shows what happens if you take away a tariff on beef and the price drops from P2 to P3. OK, now I've now added some labels on the next slide. And if you can type your answer into the chat window, please. What is the area of consumer surplus with a tariff? So I've taken away the tariff with this sort of brown dotted line. But what's the consumer surplus? when there is a tariff which area shows consumer surplus with a tariff what do we think so they need to go back to the original price which was p2 i think is now h on my diagram so what is consumer surplus with a tariff and we have some right answers including henry's got the right answer and ollie sherwin's got the right answer and chloe so the answer is coming up on the screen the area is A, C, H, because there's a fairly high price. Now, this is the important bit. OK, so that's the consumer surplus with a tariff, A, C, H. Let's move the slide on. What is the consumer surplus if we take away the tariff? In other words, we trade liberalization. The price now falls from H to I. Quantity consumed expands from Q2 to Q4. So what is consumer surplus with free trade? And the answer is coming through very quickly. Manny's got it and Rocco's got it. Herman's got it. Superb. Yeah, well done, everybody. Some great answers coming through. The answer's on the screen. It goes up from A-C-H to A-D-I. So this is your diagram you could use. If you get a question on trade liberalization, you could talk about the impact on consumer welfare. Fall in price from H to I increases consumer surplus. And the net gain, of course, is H-C-D-I. Well, of course, producers might lose out now my next little question on the same diagram is what is the lost 
government tax revenue. Uh, if we take away the tariff. So what is the lost government tax revenue, which was there with a tariff, but which won't be there uh, with free trade? Which area shows the lost tax revenue? Answers coming through. Superb stuff, everybody. Joe and Ewan, Ollie and Harvey have got it. Tobias has got it. Arhan and Danny, here we go. Here's the answer coming in. Yeah, lost tax revenue is JCLK, because that was the tax revenue. Of course, that's another key evaluation point, is that trade liberalisation in the short term might reduce the amount of tax revenue the government's got. Superb. Little challenge for you coming up, a 60-second challenge. I just love this idea of just giving yourself a minute in revision and saying, well, I'm going to try and type out or write out a paragraph. So can you please type into the chat window a short explanation? It can be as short as you like of the meaning of trade creation. So when you sign a free trade deal, trade creation effects might happen. Have a go, I'll give you a minute for this. Here we go. Okay, and very helpfully, our producer, our wonderful producer, put up some good answers on the screen there. Hopefully, maybe spot those. Or you might have been typing the answer, in which case, don't worry. Loads of good answers coming through. One or two of the ones we put on the screen were perfectly fine, but didn't quite nail the concept of trade creation. So I'll, when I show you my answer, we'll, we'll try and really focus on what you have to talk about. The idea, of course, is that you, you uh, eliminate tariffs, and therefore, within a customs union, for example, uh the the previous barrier to trade has disappeared so you'd expect the price to go down and that has welfare effects let me just show you my answer just in terms of uh what we might suggest and keep in mind also there's some great answers in the chat window you might want to uh, follow those as well trade creation occurs when businesses can import something from a lower cost producer within within a free trade area or customs union so you join a free trade area and suddenly you can now access I don't know, cheaper beef or cheaper copper from a country that's inside the agreement instead of a higher cost supplier outside the agreement. That's the trade creation. You can now source your inputs, your energy, your food, etc., your technology from a cheaper, lower cost producer. That causes a market price to fall and that leads to an increase in consumer surplus. So the best answers will then link it to a welfare concept in this case consumer surplus okay i want to make a really key point is that um uh, businesses trade rather than countries so a lot of the students in the exams talk about you know the uk importing from germany or whatever rwanda importing from ethiopia no businesses trade rather than countries although we tend to aggregate to think about the value trade at a national level okay great stuff well done nice little challenge a one minute challenge i think are really quite important here we go. Can you give me a reason, one, two, three, why trade liberalization might, little hedging word there, might lead to an improvement in economic efficiency? Have a go. What can you come up with?
Okay, nice half there from the coal allows trade to be directed to the countries which have, which have an absolute or comparative advantage. That should be a Pareto improvement in welfare. Musical Journey, one of our regulars, says more specialization, economies of scale, and lower total average cost of production. Lovely answer there. Uh, and Ollie Sherwin talks about removing the barriers which exist between firms in countries, reduces costs. So firms can produce, so we can buy goods from the most efficient, cheapest firms, exploiting economies of scale. So some lovely answers there. Can I just tidy up one or two answers with my answers? This question often comes up, by the way, to ex examine the extent to which free trade deals might improve efficiency. Make it really clear which efficiency you're talking about. Okay, so here are my three. Trade increases competition. It makes markets more contestable. In theory, it brings prices down and therefore it drives prices closer to marginal cost, which improves allocative efficiency. Secondly, trade across borders uh, encourages firms, businesses to operate at scale. And therefore, you can achieve economies of scale from, from, from trade. And thirdly, really important, I think one or two people mentioned it, but always mention dynamic efficiency if you can. Trade is a driver of research and development and also critically innovation across borders. Uh, it's one of the most important aspects of dynamic efficiency is that competition and the sharing of ideas, the transfer of knowledge and ideas across borders. So if you can link trade with efficiency, you're in great shape for the exams. Now, just moving on slightly, let's look at one example of a recent trade deal. I'm conscious here that you know I'm trying to think of things that happened in 2021, 2020, 2022, which were of interest to examiners. So the UK and Australia, God bless them, signed a free trade deal in 2021. Um, before the deal, tariffs on Australian wine, for example, were 5%, whilst tariffs on our car sold in Australia were 10%. We actually were in a trade surplus with Australia of about £5 billion a year. But look there at the percentage of our exports and imports that come from Australia. That's quite a significant number. The Farmers Union are slightly worried about the fact that Australia may now have tariff-free um, access to our markets. But in fact, nearly 90% of all UK imports from Australia already come into the UK tariff-free because the EU had the trade deal with Australia. So over to you on this one. That was a little bit of background for you. Can you please, oh no, sorry, just in terms of the, of the numbers, these were our top exports for Australia in 2021. We sell a lot of pharmaceuticals, a lot, sell a lot of cars, machinery. That's the stuff that we sell to Australia. The next slide shows the things we import from Australia and a nice little smiley face there to remind us all that we import about five million pounds a week of Australian beverages, whatever they happen to be. Okay, here's a little challenge for you. Again, let's see what the collective can come up with. And we're just going to think for a couple of minutes here synoptically. Can you please give me a possible micro effect in the UK of a free trade deal between the UK and Australia? Have a go. Some good synoptic answers coming through there on the on the screen. Uh, Louis makes the point that Foster's tell, uh, tastes terrible, which is clearly right. You should never, by the way, never drink beer out of a can because the uh, the old adage is true that they sell what they can and can what they can't. Uh, here's our point coming in from Dylan. Lower prices for consumers helping to increase consumer surplus, more choice, increase, increasing consumer welfare. The, the great point about Dylan's answer there, it's really micro. So in a synoptic question, he's focusing on prices, consumer surplus and welfare. That is a really good micro point. Uh, a couple of other people talking about current account, that will be macro. Of course, the synoptic paper is where you have to make a nice little clear dividing line between micro and macro. Here are my three points coming up on the screen. First of all, falling prices, echoing Dylan's point. But I think the key thing here, uh, Dylan will be to add some application to your answer. So I've put in here possible fall in prices for consumers who buy, for example, Australian meat and dairy products. That is application. 
in the exam. Okay, a bit of such as seasoning, uh, benefiting from trade creation, uh, exports. I think what exports is macro, but not if you make it specific to an industry. So export industries for opportunities to sell more cars, pharmaceutical products, beverages, and you could support that with a cost and revenue diagram. And maybe on the downside, increased competition for the farming sector might lead to falling profits and employment in the farm sector. So if you choose about, if you talk about individual firms or industries, that is microeconomics. Next challenge for you. Can you please talk to me about possible macro effects of a free trade deal between the UK and Australia? Have a go. And it's really good to see people posting macro uh, consequences in the chat window. Jack talks about increased FDI from countries wanting to increase exports to Australia or UK. Excellent. Once you aggregate, as Jack is doing there, you're turning it from a micro to a macro point. Uh, Repos talks about increasing trade, could boost economic growth, increased investment, job creation, higher GDP. All good macro points. Um, yeah, one or two, there's John Smith. Uh, a tidy type of beer, actually, John Smith's increased exports, improvement in the terms of trade, AD shift, right? Trade surplus, yes, the UK runs a trade surplus. Maybe that will that will grow. All good points. Here are my points. Uh, again, nothing that's out of the ordinary here, but here are my, my points. An increase in trade, yes, uh, C plus I plus G plus X. Of course, the key thing is the UK already runs a trade surplus with Australia, so that could boost aggregate demand. Uh, quite a few of you in the chat window talked about the opportunity for an increase in investment, FDI, between the two countries. Uh, I, I put in a, a downside, there could be a fall in tariff revenue. So if you take away those tariffs, uh, that could affect the UK government's finances, but a possible higher fiscal deficit. Unlikely to be huge, I would think. Just a bit of evaluation coming up. Next question. Uh, can you just give me a couple of reasons, please, why in evaluation, why the UK-Australia trade deal is unlikely to have a significant impact on the UK? 30 seconds. Nice points coming up here. Kelsey makes the point that there was already free trade on the vast majority of goods. Noah made the point about the surplus. I think Harris made a good point uh, about uh, geographical problems, large costs associated with transport. Now, that is a really good point. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. So unlikely to really boost um, trade very much. Musical journey, UK will be important with Australia. Transport costs, balance of purposes, they're insignificant part um, yeah, nice point from Rosetta there that uh, nothing I can think of with Australia that we can't buy elsewhere, perhaps a little more cheaply. So the trade creation effects are unlikely to be significant. Some really good points there. You, 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 the, the evaluation skills are looking good. Here are my two points. Trade with Australia is only a small percentage of total trade in goods and services. What was it? 1.5% of exports and 0.7% of imports. And also the tariffs were actually fairly low already. So consumers may not see any significant price reductions, in which case there's likely to be limited expenditure switching effects. Just by way of background, again, just thinking about this, I'm going to introduce a concept for you. The next slide just summarises a few points. Yeah, here's the evaluation points. Again, use the data and the extracts if it comes up in the question. Use the data to get the application. So trade is a very small percentage. On average, what, about 1% of trade? There is something called gravity theory of trade. We tend to trade most with countries with whom we're in close proximity, the European Union, for example. So many of you put, talked about transportation costs, which is a good point. 
many products already tariff free and the UK run a trade surplus in 2021 but put that in the wider context of 100 and 100 billion trade deficit in 2023 forecast so it's not it's not going to be a game changer one more topic to do well done on trade hopefully you found that useful let's now move on to the single currency i've got three bubble quiz questions for you have a go on this one i wish this was part of the exam the number of answers to the questions i'm going to pose can i be right answer going to be one two three or four none of them so post the letters in the chat window which of these countries are members of the european monetary union what do we think your four countries for our first question are ireland poland norway and the netherlands which of those countries how many of those countries are members of the european union i'll shout out a few answers coming through uh, quite a few people saying a b and d uh, the riddler says a b and d rocco says a and d um what do we reckon on this one a lot of people saying a b and d felix says a and d um what are we saying shashank says a b d um george says that norway still uses the krona and ben says a b c and d joe beagle says a and d and noah our lead supporter says a and d here's the answer coming up it is indeed a and d well done to those who got it right uh norway is outside the european union has its own currency the krona poland is inside the european union but has maintained a floating exchange rate the zloty number two harder question this one which of these eu countries have chosen the euro as their currency and your four countries are slovenia the czech republic Slovakia and Croatia. Kinching asks which currency does Poland use? It uses the Zloty. Thank you for the answers in the chat window there. Z L O T Y. So which of these countries have chosen the euro as their currency? What do we reckon this one? Tobias says A and B. Robbie Thompson says A, B, and D. George says all of them, I think. Croatia very recently. Uh, Charlie thinks it's a trick question. So is it all of them or none of them? Merlin thinks all of them. And Shashank thinks just B and D. Jake says all of them. Here's the answer coming up. The answer is three of them. The Czech Republic still has its own currency. And indeed, Nicola correctly spots that Croatia switched to the euro in January. That could well be an exam question. We'll finish with that in a second, actually. So Slovenia, Slovakia centers now for European coal manufacturing, Czech Republic outside the single currency area, similar to Poland and Hungary. Last question, the bubble quiz. I wish the bubble quiz was part of the A-level. Which of these countries are not inside the European Union single market? Now, anybody who gets this right deserves a, a special Good Friday Easter hat tip which of these countries are not inside the EU single market. Rosetta's gone for A, B and C. Freya, A, B and D. Dylan, A, B and C. Rocco has just typed to Brexit. So that's not the answer, Rocco. The answer is how many of these countries are not inside the EU single market? Joe Beagle says A, B, D. I haven't yet seen the correct answer, if, uh, if truth be told. So who can come in with a correct answer? Which of these countries are not inside the European Union single market? Ah, what are we getting here? Khaled says none of them. Uh, James says just A. Let's check the answer. I think we might have the answer. The answer is only one of them. The UK, of course, is outside the single market. Brexit. But Norway, Switzerland and Iceland are all inside the European Union single market, but outside of the European Union. Norway has membership, has pays to join. Switzerland and Iceland are part of the European Economic Area, which has membership. And this is a kind of really key point for your exams. If you get a question on Brexit and the single market, the three countries outside the EU, well, I'm asking Nancy and Preston here, Sihani, there are three countries outside the EU that are part of the single market. 
So there are models by which the UK could, some people might argue, should rejoin the single market at some point in the future. Iceland, Switzerland, and Norway, all outside the EU, but inside the single market. They pay for that. They have to pay a membership fee and the contributions to the EU budget. But that's what they've chosen to do. Really, really interesting. So the UK does have a choice there. Let's finish off with Croatia. Just two minutes, if it's okay with you on Croatia. So it's the 20th member nation of the European Union. 20% of its GDP is tourism, service economy, 6% of GDP, population in decline. A lot of countries suffering from depopulation. Could that be an exam question this year? Middle income country, per capita income about $13,000 PPP, just a, a little bit above Romania. Used to have a CUNA as a currency. Now the euro, government debt 80% of GDP, unemployment 8%. Bit of, bit of data on Croatia. Over to you for the last two questions. Can you please type into chat window three advantages for a country such as Croatia becoming the 20th member nation of the euro? Have a go. Nice answer there from Jay. We'll pick up a couple of others. Easier trade with other EU nations as businesses don't have the cost of currency conversion. Lovely point from Chris Tyson. Exchange rate stability likely, nice use of the hedging word, by the way, there, Chris, likely to attract more FDI. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, lots of good answers coming through. Here's Ollie Dan's answer. Financial stability, lower transactions costs, uh, free trade. Essentially, the single currency can be seen as a complement to membership of the single market. Some really good answers there. Here very quickly, my three answers. Yes, don't forget to use the data. 20% of their economy is tourism. And it intuitively, isn't it? It must be the case if you have a single currency. It's easier to travel to and from Croatia without having to pay those pesky conversion costs when you swap currencies. In theory, the euro is more stable than the kuna. And therefore, that reduces the risks of investing in Croatia. And in particular, it might make it more cheap cheaper, sorry, or less expensive for the Croatian government to borrow money to fund its budget deficit. So if you're linking the single currency to the yield on debt, that is very, very high level analysis for Aylam. And keep in mind, Croatia's population is declining. A lot of young Croatians have left the country in search of better work and better employment. Uh, Croatia plans to join Schengen, the border free travel, travel zone. And if, there's, if the euro is a success, particularly the tourist sector, then hopefully that might help to reverse depopulation, which would have effects on the supply and the demand side. Uh, last question, I think, for you here. Can you think about three drawbacks, downsides, risks for a country such as Croatia joining the euro? Have a go. Wow, look at these answers coming up on the screen. Those of you watching on replay and those of you with us live, uh, <laughs> these are incredible. So it's obviously a revised monetary union. You don't have to know much about Croatia. You can just apply many of the same concepts and arguments to a particular country. Here's George's point. Sacrifice of independent monetary policy, which might be important. Less control over the market for loanable funds. Yeah, well, you could use loanable funds theory. That'd be good. Uh, there was some really good answers coming through. Um, just find maybe one more. Oh, here are my answers, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Joining the euro means that Croatia gives up the option of an independent monetary policy. In other words, interest rates are now set by the European Central Bank, not by the Bank of Croatia. Um, 
Croatia also gives up the option of attempting a competitive depreciation of their old currency. So that option is still available to countries such as Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic. So they can still depreciate their currency whilst being inside the single market. Um, Croatian businesses can't rely on that. Uh, and of course, there is the, the conversion cost of joining the single currency. They joined in January. One or two complaints from consumers that businesses use that opportunity to engage in a bit of price gouging and profit plus inflation, increasing prices. It might also lead to a surge in investment into the Croatian economy, which is good news for Croatia. But that, of course, that could be investment in property. It could just be portfolio flows, people buying up housing in Dubrovnik or whatever it is. And, and that could damage property, property affordability for people living in Croatia. But some superb answers are absolutely uh terrific level of answers well done well there we go we've had five revision sessions this week and i just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's come to all five we recognize loads of names we follow the chat window we see what people are, are, are writing and it's just absolutely amazing to see this community of students coming to all the to the sessions together we've done 200 minutes of revision this week covering five topics i hope you found it useful if you have, could you maybe consider pressing the like button? Apparently the algorithm loves that. And I'm also paid by Jim by according to the number of likes I get. Now, next week, I'm doing four sessions uh, covering labour markets, market structures, development economics, and the UK economy. And uh, they'll start on Tuesday. Jim is running five business sessions. So if you have friends and acquaintances who are doing business, maybe encourage them to join in their sessions next week. I'm sure they'll find it super useful. Uh, I think we have a quick reminder about our study books. So this is the business that never sleeps. And we have our study companions for AQA and Excel, four for each topic. And they're available either from us, duty to or net, or if you have an Amazon Prime account, uh, Amazon stock them uh, as well. And they can deliver them super quick to you. There we go. It just remains for me to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. Uh, I wish you a very happy Easter holiday for those of you celebrating this weekend. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay curious. I'll see you sometime soon.